be talking today about something we all need to listen to, especially as New Hope continues to grow. The wider, the deeper the church grows, the more we need to bond together as people. There is a book that was written some time ago called The, the Friendless American Male. We're finding that people go to friendly churches, but they don't have many friends. A lot of acquaintances, a lot of play buddies, a lot of people that have an affinity that's the same. Well, we go, both go to the same youth group, or we both play in the band, or we both do sound. But the friendships aren't deepening. And so there comes fractured families, fractured churches, easily split people that uh, can leave and move away and have no problem at all because there's nothing deep anymore. And we start to develop a depth only to ourselves. We become people, as, as it were, a man as an island. Today we want to talk about friendship or the office of a friend. It's going to come up on the uh, screen, and I want you to read it with me. As we are in the book of Chronicles, we're talking about different offices. David's going to be putting some offices together in the book of 1 Chronicles. He's a logistical systems guy, and he's going to say so-and-so is overseeing the camels and because it's an agrarian society. So-and-so are going to be overseeing the donkeys, but he has a curious phrase in the middle of of all of his lectures, of who's going to oversee who, I think you'll catch it. Let's read it out loud together. The, word, the names are a little funny, but try your best. Go. Now, Asmaveth had charge of the king's storehouses, and Jonathan had charge of the storehouses in the country. Abil had charge over the camels, and Jediah had charge of the donkeys. Jaziz had charge of the flocks. Also, Jonathan, David's uncle, was a counselor and a scribe. Ahithophel was counselor to the king, and Hushai, the archite, was the king's friend. Joab was the commander of the king's army. Now hold on. There's a curious phrase in all of that. Did you catch it? Hushai, the archite, was what? The king's, the king's friend. It's like someone saying, red, green, blue, dead toad, cyan, gray, black, and yellow. It's like, well, 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 wait a second. There was something curious in there. Well, that's exactly what David was saying. He's giving out all of these roles and responsibilities. And he says, and by the way, Hushai, the archite, is my friend. We got an office and the template says friend. I don't know if you've gone into any corporate offices and you see president, vice president, director of sales, friend, manager of storehouse, sales rep. You don't see one that just says friend. But it was so important to David that it was as important as the commander of the king's armies. Friend is right before that. Very important. So much so that years later, his son Solomon is going to adopt the very same thing. In 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 5, you'll see it come up here. Let's read this one. Now this is now David is gone. Solomon is in place. He's going to start charting out his responsibilities of his, his cabinet and his office. And listen to this. Read it with me. Go. Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, and Zabad, the priest, was the king's. Ah, interesting. David, both he and Solomon, are talking about friends. I want to talk to you about the importance of friends in a pretty much friendless society where we have tons of friends on Facebook, but none are really friends. What are friends? Oh, I'm not talking about acquaintances. I'm not even talking about people that are related by relationship or blood. I'm talking about deep friendships. In the New Testament, you find two stories that deal with friends. The first is in John chapter 5. It talks about a sheep gate near there. The sheep gate is a pool called Bethesda. 
Bethesda. And let's read it together. Would you put the next one up, please? Let's see here. Hold on. Let me read uh, up to that here. Now, this pool called Bethesda, it's surrounded by five covered colonnades or porticos. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, there was one who had been there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Oh, there's another one. Would you put the other one up? It's uh, the John scripture. Anyone back there, Jeff? Sorry, I usually run it myself here. Okay, that's all right. And uh, so let me continue reading it. Jesus said to this man, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Did you hear that? I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So what's happening? He's lying by this pool for how many years? 38 years. Is that a long time? Yeah. Long time. Jesus says, would you like to get well? Well, yeah, I do, because an angel comes and stirs the water, but I don't have anyone to help me get in when it's stirred, so uh, someone jumps in before me. And I'm thinking, 38 years is a long time, dude. What have you been doing for 38 years that you don't even have a friend to push you in the water? <laughs> Friends. You know the best time you... The time you need to build friends is not in the middle of the crisis, but before the crisis comes. Friends, they may change your life when a miracle is available. The time to build a friend is not in the time of crisis, but the time before the crisis. And now we're here at Mark chapter 2. story is told where Jesus is speaking to a crowd, and there was not even room near the door. But there were four men carrying a friend, paralytic, on a mat or a pallet. And read it with me, go. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are... Now... Whose faith did he see? Yeah, yeah, did you get that? And seeing whose faith? Their faith. Now, I don't know if, if you were a paralytic guy, I bet you'd be grumbling all along because they strap you to a pallet and they're discussing, we got to get him to Jesus. And, and you're laying on the pallet saying, you know, it's, it's okay. It's all right. It's not that big of a deal. Nope, you're going in. No, it's too crowded. No. Hoist them on the roof. Dude, all right. Strap them down because we got to pull them straight up. You're the paralytic. Don't know. You are not taking me up on that stinking roof. Oh, yeah. Just hold on. We're going to wrap you really super tight. Uh, uh, no, you take me home. No. One, two, three. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Boom. And they're dragging him up the roof. What are you doing? Why am I up here? There, are, there is no chimney. Whack. Whack. What are you guys doing? We're making a door. <laughs> you're not making a door. You're destroying this guy's house. Do you know whose house it is? Do you? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> now, I don't know if you, if, if you would think this way, but if I were the paralytic, I'd be going nuts by now. This is absolutely crazy. And then... Here he is over the hole. Now Jesus is teaching, and you can see those guys. Rrr, 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 and you see this body coming down. It's like right now, you know, coming down. <laughs> and everybody quiets down. I can just see Jesus going, what in the world are you guys doing? And this guy comes before Jesus, 
And the Lord stops. I can just see him chuckle a little. And he looks and seeing their faith. You can see four faces looking through the hole. <laughs> You're forgiven. Take up your pallet and go home. And seeing their faith, you know, I, I looked at that and I thought, what a poignant scripture. Listen carefully. The message today is real simple. You need four friends that no matter how sick you are, they will do anything to get you to Jesus. Do you have them? See, in our world, we have people falling, leaving the faith, and they have no friends. Listen, you're going to be sick sometime in your marriage. You're going to be sick physically. You're going to be sick in your faith. You're going to be paralyzed in your devotion, paralyzed in decision-making. Do you have four friends? that will do anything they need to to get you to Jesus. There's going to be some time you're sick in your morality being flooded by the world's morals. You're going to start to slip and to slide. And there's going to be some times, young men, you're going to have more testosterone than you got brains. <laughs> do you have four friends that will break into your girlfriend's house, grab you, punch your lights out, drag you into the car, you're grumbling and screaming, you leave me alone, this is my life. Boom, shut up. And they throw you in the car and they bring you to my office. <laughs> do you have four friends that'll do that? You need to. That's why Solomon and David said, this is an office of a friend. Do you remember? Do you remember Nathan? who was a priest and one of David's friends when he was with Bathsheba, he went to the king himself and said, I'm going to punch your eyes out. Do you understand what you're doing? And it was because of a friend that was called Nathan that things started to turn for the good and David repented. He could have continued and destroyed the whole kingdom save a friend. You and I need to have four friends Four friends that will do anything they need to because you're going to be sick in your attitude one day, sick in your faith, ready to divorce, ready to have an affair, or just times when you're ready to bail out. The Bible says there are some who stick next to you, but brothers are born right in adversity. What does that mean? There's going to be times you'll have friends, but that friend turns into a brother when you need him the most. In the midst of adversity, they go for it. Why? Why is it so important? Why? I'll tell you why. Listen carefully. I believe that each of us is just about one step away from stupid. All of us are really one step away from stupid, making a stupid decision, saying a stupid thing, making a dumb decision about something, overreacting to something, being really tired and just wanting to bail out, one stupid step away from resigning something that God called us to, unchoosing His calling, saying, forget it. When I was in Bible college, I know God had called me there. I was 19 years old. And... Uh, I went, I was, I had gotten out of pornography and, and living with a girl and doing drugs and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted to serve Christ. I wanted to get my heart right. Well, one, one day I went down to the basement of the uh, Bible college and there were some guys that had stashed some Playboy magazines down there. And I'm just a brand new Christian. I'm thinking, I don't come here to go back into this stuff again. And I would just, I looked at it and there was another stash here and and I thought, oh, man, I don't want to live with these guys here. I'm trying to get away from these guys. 
And here I come down hundreds of miles and I'm right in the midst of a pack of rats again. And so I said, oh God, I'm out of here. I've got to find a place where people really want to serve you. And I had my bags packed. I was on my way to the bus station when one of our, my friends came and caught me and, and it was a lady named Kathy and she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the bus station. She said, why? I said, because there's a bunch of bozos that live here. And I talked to her about it and she shook her head and she said, did God call you to come to Bible college? I said, yep, but not to live with these bozos. She said, no, 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 did God call you? Yep. Did, do you think God knew that these guys would be here at the same time? Probably took God by surprise too, I'm not sure. <laughs> she said, no, 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 God knew it all along, didn't he? Yeah, 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 he did, all right. So she said, then if God has called you, then you obey God. Right now, you're obeying sin. Because you're letting somebody else's sin trump God's call. Who are you going to obey? You're going to have God's call trump everything else? Or are you going to have all these people's problems and mistakes trump God's call? It's up to you. Goodbye. I thought for a while, sat there for a little bit, turned around, unpacked my bags, stayed in Bible college. Friends, we need friends who love Jesus and love you in that order, but are committed enough to speak to you. Friends linger with you. It doesn't uh, happen just overnight. And because we are in such a fast Russia day society, we don't take time to linger with each other. Even here at church, can I encourage you just to take time to linger that when service is over, that we don't just split. Come a little bit early, have some dinner with some people, just linger. Sit and talk, get to know people. Play softball. One of the reasons we're establishing the sports teams, we're going to do some golf, Richard, is that right? And then some volleyball. Because we want people not just to be a part of a friendly church, because this is really a friendly church. We really need you to make friends. Because you're going to get sick one day. Maybe not physically. It could be physically. I have a friend that I have in Eugene, Anna, and I have known for 40 years, Dwayne Daggett. His wife, Debbie, committed suicide. She had a mental problem. Somehow got a hold of a handgun. He came home. She had shot herself in the head. Think of the trauma of a husband seeing that. He just needed out of there. I did the funeral. And he said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going down to Mexico. I just need to leave. I said to my wife, I'm going to go with Dwayne. She said, but, but we have appointments and things. We clear my schedule. I'm going with Dwayne. Went down to Baja in California, down the south into Mexico. And we stayed there for four days in the desert, talking, thinking, laughing, crying, praying. After four days, he said, I think I'm good. I'm ready to go back. We went back together. A few years later, I had a heart problem. They flew me over to Stanford to get three stents put in my heart because I had blockages. And Dwayne heard about it, and he flew down there and stayed with me for four days to make sure that it went well. Dan Shima and Carol Ann flew up to be with me to make sure that the heart was okay. And you take a look at friends. It takes years to build, doesn't it? And it, goes, and it happens in the midst of adversity in the midst of his wife's suicide, in the midst of my heart attack. See, there's going to be times you're going to have problems. There's going to be hurts in your life. But the time to build friends isn't in the middle of the crisis when you need someone to push you in the water. It's the 38 years before that. But you see, in the 38 years before that, sometimes we don't think we need friends. Why don't people build friends? Well, one of them is because we don't think we need them. When we're young and invincible, we don't need friends. I can do it all myself. We kind of have that samurai mentality. I can do it all myself. You can be Asian, you can be American, you can be Caucasian, you can be uh, Hawaiian, Polynesian, but we all have that samurai mentality. You know why samurais are extinct today? <laughs> Duh, <laughs> they had no friends. They, they had no one. It's like Pancho Villa, the old story I tell. 
He was going around just killing everybody. He'd go into a village and raid the village and just shoot everybody up. Well, and one of these big things against Santa Ana, he was shooting and bang, bang. They riddled him with bullets. And he's laying there bleeding to death. And the padre is around the corner. And, and uh, Pancho Villa says, get the padre quickly, get the padre. So the padre comes and says, what can I do for you, hermano? You are dying. He said, padre, padre, I want to go to heaven. And the padre said, well, have you forgiven all your enemies? And he smiled. He said, I have no more enemies. I have killed them all. <laughs> we do that with friends, too. So the first thing is we, we think we don't need them until the water is stirred, until you're sick and it's too late. The second is we got burned one too many times too often. And we get burned, and when we do get burned, you know who burns us? Not our enemies. It's what? It's our friends. Listen carefully. You will never be betrayed by an enemy. You'll, you'll never be betrayed by an enemy. He will kill you to your face. You'll only be betrayed by whom? Your friends. David wrestled with that, and he struggled with that. It's in the book of Psalms. I think we have that up. Would you check that and put that up? Psalm 55, and it says this. Would you read it with me? Go. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, for then I could bear it. But it is you, a man, my equal. Here it is, my companion and my familiar friend we who had sweet fellowship together we walked in the house of God together you won't ever be betrayed by your enemies betrayal only comes from friends and when you get betrayed by your friends it ain't gonna be your last rodeo and for a lot of us here being betrayed it ain't your first rodeo and it ain't gonna be your last you have to be all right with it. The Bible has an interesting uh, clause in the book of Ephesians, and it talks about the armor of God. You remember that in Ephesians 6, putting on the armor of God? The breastplate of righteousness, your loins covered with uh, the belt of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the, uh, faith, the helmet, and the sword of salvation, the word of God. Now, if you take a look at a Roman's armament, uh, everything is pretty much covered except his back. There is no armament on his back, just straps. Because the way they would do it is, Jordan, stand up here. Andrew and, and, and Derek and uh, Tim, stand up for a second. Now, I want you to face each outside and your backs together. All your backs together. Yeah, four of you, four of you. Yeah, go right there, right over here, Derek. Yeah, and then Tim, you come over here and face me. Yeah. Now, now make believe you're like fighting. Go ahead. All right, good, good, good. All right, good enough. Thank you. All right, give him a hand. Give him a hand. Yeah. You do not want to go to war with these guys on your side. Yeah. But anyway, you get the idea the Roman battalions would always fight with the others here because I am looking out for your back and you're looking out for mine. North, south, east, west. They would always fight together and they would move in a group. And when one would be slain, another group would come and they would form a circle and they would keep fighting. And if one fell down, the circle got tighter. And then if someone's circle got too small, they joined this circle, made it a little bigger, and they would constantly fight uh, because they were actually looking out for each other's what? And that's where we get that phrase, hey, I got your back. It's actually from a military formation of the way the Romans would fight. And they then began to destroy tons of armies in hand-to-hand -hand combat because they fought in that grouping. 
The armor of God does not have anything for our backs so that when you are stabbed, it's not by an enemy. It's by a friend. And that's why David said, boy, this is hard for me. It's hard for me to understand. But I want you to know here that betrayal is a part of God's design. You say, you're kidding. Uh, no, I wish I were. Do you remember in John chapter 6, he looked at his disciples and he said, did I not myself choose you and yet one of you is a devil? Speaking of Judas Iscariot. Did I not myself, what? Choose you and one of you are going to betray me. Do you think God knew about Judas Iscariot or did Judas take him by surprise? He knew. But it was all a part of God's growing up plan. It's a part of his redemption plan. And not only did Judas betray Jesus, who else did? Peter. Who else? All the disciples. Garden of Gethsemane. They all fled and betrayed him. Until he was left alone. Betrayal is a part of God's whole plan. Why? Well, listen carefully. If you posture yourself in such a way to never be betrayed ever again, you will never experience deep friendships. Because you'll get jaded. Someone said after the situation that just took place in New Hope and some, what we thought was going one way, all of a sudden, bang, went another way. Someone said to me, doesn't that make you really suspicious of people? And I said, it can. You can be jaded. But you can't allow yourself to do that because once you do that, you lose the depth of friendships. All your friendships become shallow, cautious. Now, will we get to that point where we're mad at people sometimes? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was watching some Christians do the stupidest things. And I remember, honey, you remember this. I, I came home and I was serious. I said, Anna, I've decided I don't want to be a Christian anymore. <laughs> they are weird. They stab each other in the back. They lie and they tell you one thing and do another. I don't want to hire Christians to do work for me because they lie and they don't do a good job. I'm hiring pagans from now on. <laughs> And I don't want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Or you can, follow, you can call me a follower of Christ, but don't call me a Christian. My wife said, oh, no, you want to be a Christian. <laughs> and I said, nope. Isn't that right, honey? Anna? That's right. Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> oh, I thought she was texting or something. <laughs> playing Donkey Kong. But. Yeah, so I, I, and I was serious. I said, these people are weird. They're just, I don't, we've got to figure another way for the word Christian. Maybe biblical Christians would be better, but just Christians, everybody wants to be under that nomenclature, and it's just like, they're weird. And it's just destroying the kingdom of God. So you can get jaded. I had a tendency to get jaded there, some, you know, sometime, and ago and I just thought I don't want but then you have to stop and say wait a minute you know what I found that betrayal does sometimes it's a part of God's plan to drive you to himself <laughs> drives you to himself because he's saying you cannot trust in man they will betray you you understand that now watch this listen carefully Jesus was betrayed right Jesus knew that we would be betrayed so he walked the path before we did so that we could follow in his steps. Jesus knew we would be betrayed. So he walked that path and left us a pattern to follow in his steps. That's exactly what 2 Peter says. For you have been called for this very purpose. Since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example 
to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet while being reviled, he uttered no threats. Though he suffered, he sinned not, but he kept on entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. For by his wounds we were healed. For he has taken our sin and bore it to the cross. For we were constantly straying like sheep. But now we have returned to the guardian of our souls, the great shepherd. Second Peter tells us about that, see? So one of the things God does in betrayal is he drives us back home to him. So, can I ask you over this next season, can you name four friends that will pull you out of a house if they have to and shove you into the car and say, we're taking you home? Pull you out of a club and say, enough, let's get out of here. Hey, it's my life, shut up, get out of here. You <laughs> Get into this car. You can't take on four of us. And they love you that much because there's going to be times you're going to be sick. You're going to be paralyzed. You're going to be grumbling. But there's four people, like a band of brothers, a band of sisters, that will risk their friendship and popularity with you to get you to Jesus. Lord, we need people like that. I have never yet found a man who has fallen sexually that had a band of brothers about him that had a deep relationship that he had given them permission. There was a lingering and a, and a relationship over the years built that they knew they could say anything to each other. That when they were straying, they said, don't say that. Well, I'm thinking my wife and I should be, don't, I'll knock your head off. You think about divorce like that, dude. That's crazy. You're a crazy man. Stop it. Do you have anybody that you've given permission to talk to you like that? Otherwise, we, we, we're in church and all of a sudden, what happened to Bill and Susie? You're kidding. What happened to so-and-so? I can tell you, I bet they had no deep friendships. But they could step in each other's life and say, stop. How does that happen? It happens in groups. You know? How does friendships take place? Lingering with each other, softball games, life groups, small groups. But it will not happen in big groups. So if New Hope just becomes big groups, we will be knowledgeable, scripturally acute, scripturally uh, um, uh, pretty sharp, but we won't have deep friendships. My goal over this next season is to start to develop deep friendships among us. So can I encourage you? Take the time to linger with each other. Ask God who it is. If I said to you, can you right now write down four sisters, sisters, brothers, four brothers, that would be friends like that, that would break open a roof to get you to Jesus, that would take you out of your bed, grumbling, tie you into a pallet, grumbling, take you across the country, hoist you up the side of a house, to get you to Jesus, and you're grumbling all the way. But they love you that much. Result, he got healed. Friends, and Jesus seeing their faith. You're going to be 38 years waiting for God to do something. You just need someone to push you into the water. Maybe it's a decision that you're polarized on. A decision that you need someone to just shove you a little bit. I remember we were on the Waimea Rock and there was this girl, a friend of mine's daughter, she, she looked down and she said, I really want to jump. She, you know, it's about 10 feet or so. I just really want to jump. I really want to jump. I said, well, let me push you. Oh, no, 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 no. But I really, wa I really want to jump. I said, well, then jump. Oh, I'm too scared. Then I'll push you. No, 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 no. But I really, I said, do you really want to jump? She said, yes. Boom, I pushed her. <laughs> Flash. She came up. <laughs> I said, did you like it? Yes, I loved it. 
And sometimes in life, when you're polarized on a decision, you need someone just to say, would you do it and push you a little bit. And later on, you'll say, thank you. I needed that. Do you have friends like that? On your chairs, you had a little card there, four people that you're going to invest in. You got it on Sunday, and these are people that you would be praying for, inviting to a Bible study. But this time, I put another card out there for you, and I want you to take a look at this and see if you can write, sisters, four names of people that would be friends like that to you. Do you have them? If you don't, I want tonight to help you to become aware that you need friends, that you need to invest in them. I have a friend of mine, his name is Noel Campbell, that was with me seven years in uh, Hilo and to help me pioneer New Hope. When we first started, I was 31 years old. He came for seven years, and uh, people were collecting all kinds of things. I was collecting milk caps, you know, bottle caps, and, uh, and so these, they called pogs. And th there's a moniker of some dairy or something on it. So we were collecting all of these, and I, some, and I collected stamps. I collect stamps. I said, no, I collect stamps, and I collect marbles. I had a bunch of marbles. I said, I'm collecting pogs. It's going to be worth a lot of money one day. I said, what are you collecting? Are you collect pogs? He said, no. You collect stamps? He said, no. You collect marbles? No. What do you collect? He smiled and said, I collect friends. <laughs> have you ever heard someone say something, and in your mind you think, I wish I would have said that. <laughs> I collect friends. And ever since that day, I thought, I need to do more of that, don't I? I need to collect friends. You got four? Write them down. If you don't, it's time that you pray and build them. Amen? The office of a friend. Bow your heads with me, would you? Lord, as we conclude today with this message out of uh, First Chronicles, that... Hushai the archite was the king's friend. Zabad the priest was the king's friend. Lord, we need friends. We have friendly churches, but I don't think people are looking just for friendly churches because they're normally pretty friendly. I think what we're looking for are deep friendships in these days especially in such a mobile society that's changing every 28 days, where people are zipping down the freeways and from job to house and to activity to activity. We pass each other in the night. We need to have an inner circle of friends. I know we've got acquaintances, an outer circle, an outer concentric circle of, of people that are, are just fellow employees, but... Lord, help us to concentrate over this next season of an inner circle of friends, people to whom we can bear our heart, the good and the bad, the chaff and the grain, and that friend with a breath of kindness will blow the chaff away and keep only the grain. Friends. We know, Lord, that you are our greatest friend, and we can speak with you. But like David, and like Solomon, like Jonathan, you give us friends in this life. Because there's times we're going to be paralyzed. Because we're not invincible. There's times we're going to be sick. We're not supermen. And we need four friends that will do whatever it takes to get us to Jesus. So that we might be healed. And sometimes we need a friend to just push us in the water. So God, would you help us to uh, understand this message today and begin to develop a circle of friends. So help us to be friendly. Help us to linger. Because there's a lost art of lingering anymore. But to linger with one another. So that little by little, minute by minute, day by day, week after week, month after month, a deep friendship is, is built. It forms slowly. We understand that. So Lord, may we start now 
Because when the time comes, when the water's stirred, friendships will have had to have already been built. So thank you for these things. We receive the word in Jesus' name we pray. Can you say amen, people? Amen.